If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme and would like to talk to someone for further information and support, please call the BBC Action Line on 08000 922 021. Calls are free and confidential. Lines are open from 7.30 in the morning until midnight. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. There was this terrible collision in the tunnel. It's not quite clear exactly what caused the accident. How Diana died. The Conspiracy Files. Sunday at 9 on BBC Two. In every city, millions of people live side by side in separate worlds. This is what happens when they collide. We'll just need someone to look out for a story. A new film from Dominic Savage, starring Colin Firth, and Louis Duff, David Oyelowo, with Robert Carlyle. Born Equal, coming soon on BBC One. Earth, it can bury the dead. Anybody who does Herman has had a friend who has died. Or oh, it can create new life. This project is about producing good food. It all depends. Been in jail, screws can't even tell us what to eat. What you put into it. Things are gonna get hard. I feel desperately out of my depth. But if you want it that much, you'll get there. Monty Don helps a group of heroin addicts bury their addiction. Monty Don, growing out of trouble, starts Thursday at 9 on BBC Two. Ashes highlights from an extraordinary final day in Adelaide at 11.20. First on BBC Two, Jeremy Paxman with Newsnight. Happy first birthday, Dave, but why are so many people disappointed by you? Tonight on the first anniversary of taking over the party of Disraeli, Churchill and Thatcher, we assess whether David Cameron is up to the job. He may be cuddlier than some of his predecessors, but does that qualify him to be Prime Minister? David Cameron, I've never seen a turnabout like this. We revisit the focus group which went for Cameron. Do they still love him? Could going green bring Gordon Brown to life? The new American Defense Secretary admits that the US isn't winning the war in Iraq. And is there a physical explanation for the psychological collapse of the English cricket team? Good evening. The man who claims he'll be the next Prime Minister of Britain celebrates a year as leader of his party tomorrow with his various photo calls with Huskies and hug a hoodie or even embrace Polly Toynbee initiatives David Cameron has certainly succeeded in repositioning the party, or the leadership at least. Policies apparently come next. Our political editor, Martha Carney, assists his first year. It's a long way from Norman Tebbit's on your bike. Jerusalem, not the killers, was a favoured Tory track back then. On his first day a year ago, David Cameron wanted to set a new direction for the party after three disastrous election results. So where has his journey as leader taken the Conservatives? Well, right into the heart of trendy London for a start. Borough Market and the launch of the slow food movement on Friday. I grow my own vegetables. I've even won a few prizes. Um, we have a very small village, though, so some people say uh, the competition is great. I try to buy good food, and I always cook Sunday lunch for family and friends. David Cameron's made huge efforts to embrace green politics with causes like sustainable food, an area he argues which has been neglected by Labour. By stressing the quality of life agenda, he believes he's shifted negative perceptions about the Conservatives, the so-called nasty party image. He's invited outsiders, like the environmentalist Zach Goldsmith, to work on party policy in a wide-ranging review. 
I think we certainly set the agenda on the environment. I think the government's definitely playing catch up on that. I think that uh, the very fact that David Miliband became Environment Secretary was a measure of how seriously uh, the government takes the threat that we pose in terms of that issue. Uh, I think the very fact they've brought in a climate change bill in the Queen's speech is an example of how we've pushed them. I think they passed their education bill with Conservative support, which they wouldn't have done because of their rebel backbenchers, and I think we're ahead in terms of what the public, who the public perceive as the best people to run the NHS. The strategy has meant a shift of focus away from more traditional policies like Europe and immigration, on which the Conservatives have campaigned in past elections. The new message is about the NHS and the environment. But there's no clear direction, according to one MP, who ran a leadership campaign against Cameron. What some of us are saying is it's, it's good to be upfront on all the touchy-feely issues that might appeal to Guardian readers, but you can't just do that, and that you have to look at where they... What, what, where's the journey going to end in all this? I mean, we, we all accept at the moment it's about image and perception and all of that. But what is the goal? What do we really stand for as a party? But I believe that if you've got the right ideas in your head and the right passion in your heart, and if you know what this party needs to do to change, then you should go for it. And that's why I'm doing this. And David Cameron, as the leader of the Conservatives, who would vote for David Cameron? Incredible. It was a Newsnight focus group last year which spotted Cameron's potential as leader. A year on, the Republican pollster Frank Luntz thinks Cameron has done well. I never see a group of people who are cynical and angry and ticked off about politics, who've had it with a political party, look at someone's picture, listen to what that individual has to say, and then see him speaking, and they say, my God, this is, this is what I want. This is exactly what I'm looking for in a leader. It's been a year since that happened. And in that year, he has grown in terms of public support. He has managed to, to withstand a withering attack from Labour, and to a lesser degree, the Lib Dems. And he is more credible today. But one woman who joined the party this time last year because of the David Cameron factor has recently resigned as a Conservative councillor and joined the Liberal Democrats. Penny Hedgeland explains why. I wanted to be working as a team, but I think the party is deeply divided. I think there are those who uh, believe in what Cameron says, and there are those, and there are plenty of them, who like David Cameron because he gives them a very good image, um, he gets them more votes, but I suspect they're not deeply committed to the environment or, say, putting money into public services where it's needed. So whilst uh, David Cameron and George Osborne will talk about economic stability before tax cuts. Where's the flesh on the bones, the policies? Um, where are the policies, I'd say? David Cameron isn't doing as well in the opinion polls as he might be. Fewer people are satisfied with his performance as leader than a year ago, while more are dissatisfied. The Conservative Party has gone ahead of Labour in terms of voting intentions, but they need to be much higher in order to win an election. Our first-past-the-post system does throw up some strange results, but I think it is sensible for us to assume that the party that wins the next election will probably have to have an 11-point lead over Labour. And for the Conservatives to do that, they need to be in the 40s, but not just now, in mid-term when Labour's unpopular, but in the 40s when Labour has a new leader, new policies, and maybe other events which they can manufacture which will be to their advantage. So it's not that Mr Cameron hasn't done well to date. The big question is whether he's done well enough. And I think the jury genuinely is out on that one. The Cameron project is just too metropolitan, according to Derek Conway. I mean, I think David Cameron has matured hugely in a year, so I'm happy with him. I sometimes doubt whether some of the people closest to him understand what goes on outside the, the sort of Westminster beltway, if you like. I, I think he has a problem to reach out beyond the M25. Whittam is a constituency in Essex which has just selected one of David Cameron's A-list candidates, Priti Patel. In traditional Tory heartlands like this, there has been scepticism about some of the changes made, like embracing the ideas of Guardian journalist Polly Toynbee, or the so-called hugger hoodie speech. It's a metre high section which has been pulled off and it means there are no lights at all on this side. Very few on that. Jonathan Hodgkin, a tree lover, is annoyed by local vandals. So how does he, a Tory voter, view David Cameron? It has to be other things in life as well as being green. Anyone can play lip service to being green. 
but if you've got two or three four by fours following on with all your papers while you're going along on a bicycle, not everyone can accept the message it's totally genuine, can they? Around the country, some activists believe they haven't been consulted properly about the change of direction. If the voluntary party is excluded from this policy development process, it will be an absolute disaster. Uh, and what will happen is that the policies will be announced, the resentment will explode, there'll be huge rows, uh, and that will be the end of the Conservative Party in terms of winning the next election. And we'll have to start again. But in a BBC interview tonight, David Cameron denied that charge. I think we've put together a very good team at the heart of the Conservative Party. And I do have a, an approach about building a team. I'm not some, talk to people in the shadow cabinet, I'm not some sort of dictator who says we're going to do this and that and that. You know, I build a team, work with a team, that's the way to do it. The cycle of change, sorry, clearly has its critics on the Tory right. But it shows that the party is modernising. Triangulation, as it's known in the new Labour rulebook, studied by the Cameron strategists. But in his next year, David Cameron will have to quell the criticism that he's more style than substance. Well, as you saw in Martha's report, one of the key early indicators that David Cameron might win the Tory leadership was the judgment of one of our focus groups hosted by the US pollster, Frank Luntz. We got four of the panel members who supported him then back together in the studio earlier tonight to see how they feel about him now. OK, let's talk about David Cameron. Do you believe this man stands for anything? I think that's a good question. One, one of the things that I think that... What does David Cameron stand for? Um, one of the things I'd say is he's very well known as a brand, uh, which is essentially what Blair was when he, he began. Uh, he's very well known. He's brought the Conservatives to, to be in opposition. But what does he actually stand for? What are his policies? That's, I, I don't know. And I, I've spoken to a lot of people, and they, they're not sure either. I, I, you like moment. what you see, though. I think it's clean cut. I think it's yeah. something for the youth to look up to, and um, and again, it's, it's that social thing. I think that our youth of today haven't got anybody that can reach out and touch. We've gone through the shift in change. We had the Blair, and and the you know 12 years ago there was people of that generation looking up to him. Now, the the new generation coming through need to have somebody to look up to. Well, Christine, do you by. buy all this stuff? His connection with the youth? Um, I do, but uh, but I think that that's that's also a play. I think he's actually standing for renewed faith in politicians. Um, I think that uh, the past governments have underestimated the capacity of the British public to really be sitting up and listening now to what's happening in politics. And I think the old promises, a bit like football managers, how they get moved around from one club that they've just failed at to make a success at the next club. And I think that the British public now have got more of an interest, more of a, uh, an, um, an ability to understand what's happening in politics. And I think he's bringing forward new faith. I just think um, his, his policies would be anything that would get him a vote. He's trying to spread himself out so wide with so many different areas that it's it's a vote catching ploy. Well to be fair to him he hasn't really got any policies Exactly, yet, he? he's just clack, clutching onto the green issues, yeah. the ha hugger hoodie or whether he said do this you, or not. Is, I is, mean do you find all that persuasive? Posing with husky dogs and going around yeah. talking about hugging hoodies or embracing polytoinable. I'm going to be honest with you, as a package he looks, he looks the part. Oh, well, he right. looks the part. He looks he? the part. Well, I, th I, th I think he's had a, a successful year. I mean, uh, he's been a, a relatively quick year as well, but he, I think he's come a long, a, a long way. I think he's stood his ground. I think he's voiced uh, the Conservative new ideals. Um, and an awful lot of Conservative issues he hasn't touched upon. He's none of that tough talk on crime or immigration or Europe. Oh. Well, he's, he's, but he, you know, that's I, notable by his absence, isn't it? No, he, he, I, I think he, he has touched on it. Um, I think uh, that the, these tough times are here because now he's actually got to widen his, his, his touch on it. He's actually got to get a hold of these, these policies and bring them to the forefront. I oh, think I, it, it, I'm sorry, I, th I think he's waiting. I think he's... Mm. I'm not quite sure that his tactics and his politics are in, in waiting are correct. I actually think that um, the PR for Mr Cameron is somewhat lacking. He's not visible enough. I'd say the was, the one, I should have thought one thing he was was mm. visible. I don't it? think he's mm. visible enough. I, I don't think we've heard enough publicly from him. I think what we're looking at here is the beginning of something. Um, 
it's been a year, it's been a long time. As yet, there's nothing concrete. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be any strict policy. There doesn't, doesn't seem to be anything you can really get your teeth into and say, this is what Cameron's about. This is what he stands for. In regards to waiting, I think you've got a good point. The, the question is, what is he waiting for? More importantly, who is he waiting for? Because the issue is, uh, he's really going to have the test when he runs for government. Mm. And he's going to be against people like Brown. Mm. Maybe Brown, he might, might be somebody else. But at the moment, it's unsure. It very much hinges on what the Labour Party are going to do. And then maybe, by, by then, he may have said, oh, these are going to be my policies. I think that's exactly the point. <coughs> I, think, I think he's got, uh, if he's weak in one particular area, I think it's his foreign policy. Because I, I, he's kind of pro-American, but and, and was pro-Iraq, but then he, he, he took a backward step and and he went against the fact that we went to war with Iraq. Do you really think he's a conservative? I think the question is now, what is conservative? It seems like at the moment everybody's fighting for the middle ground. Mm. They've they changed the policies so much. They're not the conservative that you would have in your mind, say that you know the Thatcher days, the, the major days. They're very different now. But who knows what they're becoming? They're changing so much about. The conservative well, brand. Yeah, but you're still all disaffected Tories or, or potential mm. Tory voters. Mm. Um, do you recognise this man? I think he's conservative, but I think he's he's um, a softer conservative. I think he's got a bigger heart. Do you think? You know, you've already mentioned. You've already mentioned the question of who will be up against. Let's assume it's Gordon Brown. It yes. could be John Reid yes. or some other Scotsman, I suppose. Um, do you really reckon that he could defeat someone like that? Yes. I think, I think I think that's if he's convinced. You go ahead the then, first. You you I, I, his personality will defeat Gordon Brown if Gordon Brown is the is the leader of the Labour Party. Why do you say that? Pe people just vote for personality. My my opinion yeah, and what I've course. seen. Um, this is how Blair got in. Blair was a personality. He didn't really have many policies when he came in, and he did near enough exactly the same as Cameron was doing in the first year, and until it went to um, the election, then the policies started coming out. And David Cameron seems to be People following just exactly. like him, he's a more likeable exactly. man. Exactly, exactly. I think there's, yes. uh, there's, two, there's two issues here, I think, and, and they're both a win-win for Cameron. One is, 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 is Blair-esque in, in, in appearance and in approach. Um, he's, I think he is a Conservative. Um, and I think it's something that uh, people, that, again, the youngsters can relate to and touch on. I also think from a Labour point of view that uh, the, the Blairites within the Labour Party will probably say, well, we're not happy with Gordon Brown. We'll we'll mm. we'll go with uh, with Cameron. I think mm. you may find a defection from Labour to. to but also, also, what the people want from the next election. I mean, somebody like Reid could really get some votes. When you look at Iraq and and his his, his tough stand on on being sort of the Home Secretary, he did really really well in terms of um, in terms of boosting his image. When he was it, he was, he was very involved with the stopping the bombs on the planes, wasn't he? So somebody like Reid could really be a, a vote puller. I'd say more so than Brown because. Everybody's got a good view of Reid. He's proven, he's tried it, he's got Would the Would you back Cameron against him? At this stage, I, I, I wouldn't be prepared to give an answer because it's Cameron doesn't... Year, it's years away. He doesn't stand for anything. What about you, Christine? You have the last I, word. I, yeah, I think that, um, that there's an issue uh, regarding where Gordon Brown has come from. The fact that he, were, he is Chancellor of the Exchequer. The fact of what he's done as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Mm. The fact that the more and more and more stealth taxes are coming in to hit the middle class mm. who are going to suffer. Mm. And then when they see Gordon Brown against David mm. Cameron, mm. people are going to see that rather than mm. potential for leadership. Certainly. And I think where David Cameron will win will be, mm. he's for the British public, he's for mm. families, he's mm. for keeping marriages mm. together, he's for giving young people something to hope for, he's for putting back some social structure into our communities, mm. and then they'll go, weigh that against stealth taxes, mm. Mm -mm, no, not really interested. All right, I suspect we'll be revisiting this, so thank you all for now, anyway. <laughs> now, David Cameron's likely opponent at the next election gets his hour in the sun tomorrow. He'll pr be presenting his 10th annual pre-budget report. The recitation of claims about how fast the economy is growing and likely fiscal strategy sounds dry as dust, except to people like our economic editor Stephanie Flanders, of course. The tightest political focus will be on whether he does anything on the issue that Cameron has tried to make his own, the question of whether the planet has a future. We asked Stephanie to find out what kind of green taxes Gordon Brown might be planning. We'll have to wait till tomorrow to find out exactly what's in Gordon Brown's last pre-budget report, but we're expecting it to be distinctly green. I've decided to take my green car and my not-so-green Gordon 
out for a spin to find out exactly what a carbon-friendly tax system would look like. There are loads of ideas for green taxes floating about. Lots of people fancy a plastic bag tax, for example. But ever since the Stern review a few weeks ago, the big focus has been on carbon emissions, especially that government commitment to cut the UK's emissions by 60% by 2050. Emissions fell for most of the 90s, but recently they've been growing by around 0.6% a year. Even if we started on the 60% pledge tomorrow, we'd need to cut emissions by 1.9% a year to achieve it. If you look at where the growth in emissions has come from, the likely candidates for green taxes seemed clear. Emissions from industry have fallen 17% and from commercial users they're down 12% since 1990. But emissions from residential homes, about a quarter of the total, have only dropped by 1% and transport emissions have risen 8%. At this rate, transport would be responsible for a third of all our emissions by 2020, three times its share in 1970, with aviation emissions the fastest growing part. I'm taking the car, Gordon, and my green guru, Stephen Hale, the director of the Green Alliance, to Luton Airport. He's not what you call pro-plane. Emissions from this sector are growing by 6% every year. It could take up all of the UK's carbon budget within 30 years. So that's, we wouldn't be able to have any domestic energy, no driving, no nothing, we'd just be getting in planes. Exactly. It's an incredible anomaly. And something has got to be done, and fast, to begin reducing emissions from this sector. But what could he do then? Well, the Chancellor's effectively allowed the tax to fall from this sector, and his revenues have been falling as a result. So he needs to move fast this week perhaps initially by doubling the rate of air passenger okay. duty. At a time when travel on no-frills airlines has quadrupled, tax revenues from aviation have fallen in real terms. Back in 2000, the Chancellor was making £13 per person in air passenger duty. Now it's a mere £8.73. We're off to hear from the Chief Executive of EasyJet why Gordon Brown should leave APD well alone. We believe that the right way forward is to bring aviation into the European emissions trading system and that will put aviation on the same footing as other carbon emitting so industries. they will pay for the ability to emit carbon? The problem with APD is a very blunt instrument. Uh, it penalises all airlines the same. Airlines like EasyJet are environmentally relatively very efficient. We emit 30% fewer uh, emissions per passenger kilometre than a traditional airline because we fly modern aircraft, our aircraft are just two years old, and we fill them 85% full of people. At the moment, APD is five pounds, which, re which represents 11% of the average EasyJet fare. Now compare that with 40 pounds APD on a long haul flight, and it's a tiny proportion of a 2,000 pound business fare uh, to New York. Well, that's Stephen. I mean, it does seem you, you, you are in effect penalising the poor. We know all those people are still going to get their business flights. Well, I think the facts just, just don't support that position, actually. The vast majority of the growth in cheap flights has been coming from the middle class who tend to fly more rather than new people coming into the industry. And I think the bigger picture that Andrew is setting out and the claim in the adverts of EasyJet that orange is green to me just doesn't stack up. I think Elvis Lives would be, would be just as credible. What we don't want to have is alarmist exaggerated claims like that. Aviation is one of the most powerful uh, sources of value creation known to man. It's right at the heart of international trade and anything that we do which restricts the growth of aviation will have a substantial economic cost. You and I, for example, could both turn down the central heating in our houses with no economic cost at all. We could both drive smaller cars with no economic cost. Stephen wasn't bowled over by EasyJet's passer, but he did agree that aviation is a bit different. We can generate energy, run our houses, uh, run our companies and use energy. All of those things we can do without consuming and emitting carbon. But we don't know a way of getting a plane in the air without emitting carbon. So the science tells us we can only afford to generate so much carbon. And perhaps aviation is going to become our premium way of using that limited allowance. Which puts the emphasis on trying to get everything else down. Exactly. At which point he insisted we go to the other side of the M25 to see a joint British Gas Council scheme that gives people 50 to 100 pounds off their council tax 
if they get cavity wall insulation to cut their energy bills. Well, I really wanted Gordon to see this, because I think it proves something that the environmental groups have been saying for absolutely ages, that if only Gordon gives people strong tax incentives to act, then they will do. It's really worked well for us. I mean, we had more response to this scheme than anything else we've ever done. And we've always offered money off. But people just love getting money off their tax bill. Stephen, what kind of savings do you get from this? I mean, how important is the domestic energy? Well, I think the householder themselves can save on their energy bill the cost within 12 months in many cases. So really, the economics of this are fantastic. Well, it's about 200 quid or something. About 200 pounds, yeah. yes. That's roughly the cost and roughly the savings. The Chancellor may well be thinking of new ways to get people to save energy at home in the PBR, but he's sworn against drastic measures like extending VAT to domestic fuel. To see how much easier green incentives are always than green taxes, you only need look at his feeble record on taxing fuel for cars. We intend to raise road fuel duties on average by at least 3% a year in real terms in future budgets. In addition, the unlikely the green hero in this story is Norman Lamont, who introduced an escalator in system in 1993 duty, to raise fuel duty faster than inflation. The real duty on petrol almost doubled after that, but since Brown got rid of the escalator in 1999, the level of duty has fallen to its lowest level since 1997. There's big money involved here. If the Chancellor had simply kept the duty at the same level in real terms, it would now be raising an extra 4.2 billion a year. Yeah, the petrol duty is quite a big deal. Yeah, I think it's really important what Gordon does this week, and it's a real test of his credibility. Real petrol prices are falling here at the pump, and Gordon's got to do something about that. But isn't he really worried about getting loads of um, more protests, like the fuel protests for you? Six months ago, when they introduced vehicle excise duty, higher taxes for gas guzzling cars, I'm sure they thought that, that would be very controversial, and it was. But only because the tax was so small. Was too exactly. So they've got to go a lot, lot further. Another way to extract new cash from motorists would, of course, be through road pricing. In his transport review for the Chancellor last week, Sir Rod Eddington suggested you could raise up to £30 billion a year that way. After the congestion charge happy hour of 6.30, we inveigled the Institute for Fiscal Studies green tax expert out for a drink to discuss the virtues of road pricing as a green tax. We think of that as being a green tax, but is it actually a green tax? Well, it depends on what people do with the revenues, actually. So if you use the revenue from road pricing to cut fuel duty or cut vehicle excise duty, one possibility is that what might happen is that people simply drive more efficiently and actually increases the volume of traffic on the roads. More and so efficiently, like they go to roads that are less full. So absolutely, yeah, and, and at different times of the day. And so by increasing the volume of traffic, what you might actually do is increase emissions rather than reduce them. What do you think of that? Well, I think he's right. The government seems to be mainly preoccupied with congestion. That's the main driver for road pricing. But they've also got to introduce a system that actually reduces emissions. It's not clear they're going to do that right now. They also need to spend the revenue right. That's pretty critical to this. There is this feeling that you ought to spend your revenues from green taxes on green things. Yes, certainly some people argue that. Um, some economists, though, think that it's actually quite a bad idea to tie your spending on something like green issues and green defences to the revenue from a particular tax, because there's uncertainty about how much money you're going to get from year to year. And in addition, the idea of green taxes is to change people's behaviour. But Andrew's got a point, though. If you, in the long run, you might have declining revenues. There's a sort of irony that the more money you get from green taxes, the less you're obviously changing behaviour, that people are still carrying on driving and they're just paying the higher price for petrol. Well, obviously, I want to secure the environmental outcome. If the revenue falls over time, then to some extent that, that's evidence of success. So there's the rub about green taxes. If you say, as the Tories do, that you'll use the revenues to cut taxes elsewhere, you're betting that green taxes won't change people's behaviour and the money will keep pouring in. But if you don't take the chance to cut other revenues, you're likely to hear the words stealth and tax. Bye. Have fun! I left Stephen with Gordon Brown to convince him which way he should jump tomorrow. When it comes to number 11, it's got to be the environmentalist's first and only chance to have the last word. Well, Stephanie's uh, with us now, mercifully without her cardboard cutout of Gordon Brown. Uh, now, on this environmental theme, 
Far from making friends with the environmentalists, he's commissioned a report today which seems to have really got their dander up. And it was one of those cases where uh, his desire to sort of burnish his touchy-feely green credentials comes smack up against those, uh, his obsession with those uh, dry-as-dust economic things that you mentioned earlier. He's, all the reports into ec the economy over the last few years and why our productivity growth, for example, has lagged behind America's over the last few years has always pinned the blame on the fact that our planning restrictions make it very difficult for companies and shops to set up uh, out-of-town shops, for example. And he's asked an economist, Kate Barker, to write this review which came out today and she has an economist solution which is to streamline the planning procedures for businesses also for that loft extension that i'm sure you are planning to make a lot of these things easier and also to centralize a lot of the very big decisions on infrastructure like reservoirs and uh, power plants and yeah the greens are not very happy about it would it as they claim mean the end of the green belt well that's the most controversial thing actually all she says is that the planners should review their green belt procedures and she makes a point actually the environmental point that if you're forcing commuters to live further away from town on the other side of the green belt you might be actually adding to pollution and emissions by forcing them to live there and in fact people in towns might want green more greenery inside towns not necessarily on the edges but i think i think it's safe to say it's so controversial anything a really big change to the green belt is not on the horizon obviously business will be uh, pleased with this if it's acted upon where are the Tories on it? Well, they admit that they're trying to change their position. They were, they were felt to be very much in the NIMBYs corner in the last election. They were, again, they were always on the side of, these, uh, of the activists stopping um, planning, and that was, that was how they went into the last election. They are trying to change that, and today they said they did see the case for having more of a presumption in favour of uh, new, uh, new building and new development. But they, as ever, they say that they wouldn't do it this way. They'd still want to give more control to... Uh, local groups. If there is a big emphasis on green taxes tomorrow, presumably there is, it's not without political, it's party political. Well, the perception is that uh, Gordon Brown, now that the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives have talked about the need to shift taxes in favour of uh, taxing bad things, having more green taxes, that he has carte blanche to do what he likes and raise taxes because they'll have to support it. But I, I have to say, on the conversations I've had with senior Conservatives, I don't think we should expect George Osborne just to accept any green taxes that he uh, asks for. I think he, uh, they will look and see whether there are increased cuts in taxes to counteract it, which is what they say. They will always balance tax cuts uh, in other areas. And actually, they do point out that he's more vulnerable than them on this. If, if he stands up and talks about green revenue raises, it's another stealth tax. If they do, it's, gosh, isn't it interesting? The, uh, the Tories have changed. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you. Now, the man George Bush has chosen to replace Donald Rumsfeld as Defence Secretary did his boss no favours today. When Robert Gates was asked whether America was winning the war in Iraq, he said simply, no, sir. All options were on the table, he said. No talk of staying the course any longer. And tomorrow, the group asked by George Bush to consider all options will deliver its report. Our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban, reports now from Washington. Congress is back at work and Iraq is at the top of its agenda. During the election, the American people spoke out for a new direction, and they said that no place was a new direction more necessary than in the war in Iraq. And after the seismic shift of the midterm elections, the Democratic majority convened a meeting to lay out its alternative. This is a historic event here today, the first meeting of the Democratic majority of the House focused on Iraq. There are differences, of course, among 230 people, but there is a consensus that there has to be a strategic disengagement. And Speaker Pelosi and the committee chairman are going to use the power of the majority to hold hearings, to shape legislation, to push for a wider education. This is really going to make a difference. Today's confirmation hearing for the new Defense Secretary, Robert Gates, provided the Democrats with a chance to show that difference, and the White House with one through the lips of its Rumsfeld replacement to show contrition. We are not winning the war in Iraq, is that correct? That is my view, yes, sir. And the therefore the status quo is not acceptable? That is correct, sir. All of this was music to the ears of the senior Democratic senator on the committee, who now promises a speedy confirmation to anyone who shares his view of the scale of the Iraq problem. The situation in Iraq has been getting steadily worse, not better. Before the invasion of Iraq, we failed to plan to provide an adequate force for the occupation of the country or to plan for the aftermath of major combat operations. 
So everyone's agreed that America has been fought to a stalemate, but how to get out of it? President Bush and his new defense secretary will hear the views of James Baker's Iraq study group tomorrow and of Tony Blair at the White House on Thursday. But as the congressional and policy machine chews through various helpful suggestions, time will not stand still. Senator Warner, you talked about the need to build a bipartisan consensus. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it will be before the U.S. has a new Iraq policy? Well, I, I would leave that entirely up to the president, but I anticipate and I draw on what his national security advisor has said recently, it's a matter of weeks, not uh, months. And so I'm confident that will be the case. And I think we've also got to recognize if we're going to move towards a bipartisan policy and hopefully the Congress and the executive branch, namely the president, are together, all of us perhaps will have to give in a bit here and there to make that possible. Democrats on the Senate Armed Services Committee want weeks of hearings on Iraq, but even their more illustrious members may glaze over at the thought of debating least worst policy options for that long. Ultimately, the president will decide on future Iraq policy, and for now, everyone's trying to influence his decisions. Well, Mark joins us now from Washington. Now, Mark, what's your guess? Will the Democrats be able to set the agenda on Iraq? Well, the extraordinary thing in this town at the moment seems to be that all of the people with a vested interest in this, the military, the foreign policy establishment and the White House, seem to be involved in a sort of game of making the Democrats think that they will be setting the agenda, but doing exactly what they planned to do in the first place before those uh, midterm elections that changed the political scene so much here. So, for example, many of the specific measures that we now hear being talked about of putting more people into training the Iraqi armed forces, of pulling Americans back more from the streets of Iraq cities into a smaller number of bases, are things which uh, senior commanders, uh, when I visited Iraq, for example, in October, were talking about the Americans and say uh, doing, and, and that they were planning to do those things well before the midterm elections. And so, in many of these cases, uh, it, will be a, it will be a matter of getting democratic endorsement for these things that were already going to be tried to try and improve the situation. Uh, I think the pinch points will come on one or two very specific issues where, for example, on the issue of some sort of timetable for the withdrawal uh, of US forces for Iraq, there'll be no uh, way of squaring the circle uh, between what the White House was saying previously and what the Democratic leadership has been saying. And there, something will have to give. And the Democrats seem to say that they will be able to influence the, the uh, uh, debate on that issue and they will get some sort of timetable out of this. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Now, coming up on the programme. It's just too easy to say it's an English disease. What is it about our minds and bodies that makes us all so prone to bottling when it matters? Before that, though, a roundup of today's news. The MOD has announced tonight that a Royal Marine was killed today in a battle with Taliban fighters in Afghanistan. A second Marine was also injured during a battle in the southern village of Gamsa in the Helmand province. Russian prosecutors say they'll turn down any extradition request by Britain in the case of the poisoned former security agent Alexander Litvinenko. Scotland Yard detectives who are in Moscow have also been told they'll be able to attend interviews of any witnesses or suspects but won't be able to ask questions. More than 30 years since the last manned space mission to the moon in 1972, the US space agency NASA has announced plans to build a permanent base there. Due to open sometime after 2020, the base is intended to serve as an outpost for future travel to Mars. The markets, the FTSE 100 share index was up in New York, the Dow Jones uh, also closed up against the euro, the pound was down against the dollar, the pound was also down. We've all done it, all you have to do is turn up and do what you know how to do, but somehow you completely blow it. You won't be surprised to hear that this is an item about the England cricket team of which highlights, highlights after this programme. But what is it in nature that makes our minds and bodies, particularly English minds and bodies, fail spectacularly when the pressure's on? And why does it happen? What a win for Australia. A stunning test match victory here in Adelaide. They look down and out at Oh, Rick You don't have to be English to bottle it. Perhaps the greatest sporting example is a Frenchman, Jean van der Velde, the 1999 Open Championship at Carnoustie. 
no force on earth could stop him winning except himself. He's surely not going to go and climb down in there and try to whack it out of there. No, no, that would be, that would be, that would be totally ridiculous. It almost looks as if the French golfer or English penalty taker has a physical affliction under that pressure. Yet a German footballer or an Australian cricketer still seems able to function at 100% in the most stressful circumstances. I asked an Aussie professor about bottling. Mentally, if you're anxious, then your brain processes may not be as clear as they would be otherwise. You may begin to doubt yourself. As soon as that happens, what happens physiologically is that your body can make mistakes. So in sport, what we'll see is the motor skills, the ability to execute a stroke in cricket or a serve in tennis or you know, bowling a ball, those things begin to break down because you lose the confidence in the, in the, the, the skill itself. Does what is true in sport apply more widely? Simon Curtis looked confident going into Mastermind until this happened. Eight passes, Simon Curtis, only one point. David Davis looked like a winner in the Conservative leadership election until his nervous stumbling speech at Tory conference. Does it imply in areas outside sport? Yeah, I mean this is, this is a life skill. Sports psychology, business psychology, life psychology are all very similar. They're all about the mental belief that you have and your ability to achieve the goals that you set yourself. Is that why you see so many second-rate people who are insufferably functions do well in life? Uh, possibly so. The consolation for England is on the rugby field, despite being trampled by the physically superior All Blacks. New Zealand have been the best side in the world for most of the last 20 years, and they're runaway favourites for next year's World Cup. But history says they always bottle it. They haven't won since 1987. Now with us now here in the studio is Andy Barton, who's a sports psychologist. We're joined from Bristol by Dr. Harry Witchell, who's a physiologist based at the university there. Uh, Dr. Witchell, this is usually attributed, this sort of failure, to some sort of psychological block or incompetence or something, but could it have a physiological explanation? Well, certainly the beginning stages I would expect to be completely psychological. But if these uh, players are under a lot of stress mentally and put themselves under stress consistently, then they will ultimately cause small amounts of damage physiologically. What ultimately happens is if they get into a stress situation where they have too much of the hormone cortisol, they can end up start breaking down proteins, essential parts of tissue, very small amounts, which might not make a difference for a normal person, but to perform at an elite level internationally would be quite troublesome. Uh, what do you make of that assessment then, Andy Barton? Uh, yeah, certainly, if, if too much stress, too much... Um, what you're thinking has a, has a major impact on, on what you're feeling. The two are inextricably linked. The, the mind and body are, are essentially one item. So there is a physiological factor at work here? Yeah. I, um, the physiology impacts on, on what you're thinking and what you're thinking impacts on your physiology. Now, Dr. Wichel, if that's true, I mean, you know, all sorts of bodily functions we understand, but we understand you know, why we sweat, for example, but what evolutionary purpose is served by that sort of physical reaction? Well, if, if you imagine an evolutionary situation in which we are not living in homes and in nice middle-class lives, but rather that we're actually trying to get food, and there are brief periods where we either have to run away from pred predators of ourselves or get prey, then what we really need is an ability to very quickly mobilize energy. The stress hormone cortisol, along with a variety of other uh, stress responses, is very good for that. Our difficulty is what happens if you have consistent mental stress in an environment where you can't actually expend physical energy. You, and I don't think that we evolved to actually cope with that particular situation. So there is an evolutionary purpose to be gained by, as it were, bottling it. I don't know about by bottling it. I think the evolutionary purpose was to always win. That is to escape from predators or to be able to catch things that are being hunted. But now that we have lived a different lifestyle for which we did not actually evolve, uh, there is a former purpose that we might not be completely suited for purpose with the kind of stress wiring we have for a, 20th, a 21st century lifestyle. Well, now, this is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I mean, psychologically, what do you do in these circumstances? 
if you're a sportsman. Well, if you're a sportsman, um, you work on, on changing that. You're changing what's, what's going on in the mind. So it actually and has that an changes what happens in the body. What ha happens in the body. So you, you use techniques like mentally rehearsing a positive outcome. The more that gets reinforced, the more the belief goes with it, the more you're going to be in control of how you're feeling. Um, but there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of forces going on. For the England cricket team, for, um, for instance, they're, they're away from home, they're mm -hmm. in an environment where they're not used to, so, so there's a the lot England of things The England cricket team might be better, away, better at running away from Lions than the Australian cricket team, for example. <laughs> um, essentially, they're, they're, they certainly have a, have a good shot of adrenaline going through the body, which, which will uh, reinforce that, certainly, yeah. Uh, what do you reckon, Dr. Witchell? Well, I, I, I think it is true that if the players, and, and it is known that some of the players have had problems with stress, that if uh, individuals are trying to perform at a consistent elite level, that while a small amount of stress at, at just before play might be very useful, consistent stress will actually deteriorate, it, cause their performance to deteriorate. And so that's not to be recommended. So obviously anything that the team can do to look after their players, particularly at a psychological level, to, be, to stop the process before it begins will be incredibly useful. Well, what would you recommend? Are you talking... If yeah, yes, yeah, what are you asking you? Well, indeed, I think the, a, a psychologist would be better suited to stay, state, the, state things like how relaxation and mental rehearsal will work but certainly if they are wa walking into what they consider to be a difficult situation and they say freeze, or they go through some sort of fear response, then that's not going to be helpful. So they have to be able to both deal with stress when they get into it, and they also have to be prepared beforehand right. to not have stress. Uh, now, Andy Barton, uh, what would you recommend? They've got a week. They've got a week. What, what they, first of all, they need to do is take all the positives out of what's happened, because... The first innings, um, they were performing very well, uh, and there's, there's no point actually dwelling on the mistakes because what you do, you actually mentally rehearse the mistakes. So they need to know what they've done right, and then actually work out a strategy for what they need to do to be even better, um, what what they can learn from the experience. Okay, thank you both very much indeed. Uh, tomorrow morning's uh, front pages. Now, the Times has news that uh, four by fours are selling in fewer and fewer numbers, and consequently, the price of second-hand four by fours is dropping uh, through the floor. Firms are going to face compulsory carbon quotas under new uh, legislation, apparently, and um, previewing the uh, pre-budget report tomorrow. Gordon Brown's going to raise uh, duty on petrol in that. Schools will be at the heart of Brown's PBR plans in the Financial Times. The Independent keeps up its campaign about uh, what happened uh, to justify or not the invasion of Iraq and the Sun is uh, celebrating Christmas baubles that many councils disapprove of. Well, that's all from Newsnight tonight. I'll be back tomorrow. The whole thing's available again on the website at the usual address. The bidding at Christie's today for the little black dress worn by Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's spiralled way beyond the estimates. It finally went for £410,000 more than enough, as Holly Golightly might say, to drive out the mean reds. Good night. Nigella top tips for an irresistible Christmas. Nigella's Christmas Kitchen starts tomorrow at 8 on BBC Two.
introduce some members of my group to you before we go any further. On back and vocals, the Sugar Babes. The man with your beautiful voice, Mr. Marvin Gaye. On the lead guitar is Jimmy Page. On the rhythm guitar, Noah Gallagher. And on the drums, Keith Moon. On bass guitar. On bass guitar, Cheryl Crow. And finally on piano, the legendary Stevie Wonder. Play it, Stevie. Two-year-old playing with your own feces. Just because it tastes good, Donna, doesn't mean to say it's right. So, getting fit. Yeah. It's a weird thing you swipe when you're not eating a kebab. Living the dream. Pull in Thursday, 10.30 on BBC Three. Or watch online now. This is BBC Two, exploring our love-hate relationship with the Aussies. Clive James and Jermaine Greer share their feelings in 40 minutes, and I'd love to express mine, but it's not critical.